Hello and welcome to our documentation on the Drought Effect Monitoring Station. I am Ziad Helu. I will explain to you during this documentation video with my colleague Georgia Jubanu how we set up our station to monitor the effect of drought on forests. First, we will cover the materials used in our project, the ESP32 and the specific sensors to measure the air temperature, relative humidity, ground temperature and soil moisture. Then we will talk about the methods used uh, to set up our station, combining all the sensors, the code used to automate the process and how we use the MQTT protocol to send the data to the back-end database InfluxDB through Node-RED and to visualize them in the front-end visualizer Grafana. Hello, my name is Georgi Chobano, and as my colleague Ziad Hello already introduced to you, we took the initiative of sharing this project with the aim of bringing awareness about the effects drought has on growing trees in the forest and natural ecosystems in general. Trees are one of the most important elements of green infrastructure in cities and community areas. But, as we know already, climate change is specifically affecting trees in many European cities. That's why the purpose of our project is to collect data for the future about the drought that drives trees to die. Drought is a natural and anthropogenic hazard common to all climate zones in the world, generally referred to as a sustained occurrence of below average water availability due to the precipitation deficit and soil moisture decline. Our focus is mainly on monitoring soil moisture, air humidity, ground and air temperature by using specific sensors designed to measure these parameters. The German forester and author Peter Wolleben stated that in the next 10 years we could see 50% of the artificial forest dying because of bad management. That should be a severe trigger for people to raise their consciousness and take corresponding measures for the benefit of the trees and forests. Operating the Drought Effects Monitoring Station at a low cost, microcontrollers are the best option to control our sensors automatically. Microcontrollers are small computers that contain one or more CPUs with memory and programmable input and output peripherals. Looking at the two microcontrollers available, the choice between Arduino Uno and ESP32 fell on the latter. Although ESP32 is more complex than Arduino for beginners, it has a lower power consuming system with integrated Wi-Fi and Bluetooth compatible with Arduino. Since the station is battery powered and data is uploaded using Wi-Fi, ESP32 is the best option. The HT11 is an ultra low cost digital temperature and humidity sensor which can be connected easily to ESP32. The sensor consists of a temperature measurement device to measure the temperature and a resistive moisture sensor to measure the relative humidity. Some applications would be humidity and temperature regulator, automatic climate control and environment monitoring. When speaking about capacitive soil moisture sensors, we refer to a sensor that approximates the moisture content in the soil by using the working principle of a capacitor, as the name already suggests. We are using the capacitive moisture sensor because it is made of a corrosion-resistant material, giving it long service life, so the sensor's electrodes are not exposed and no electrical current flows between them, therefore making it the best moisture sensor. The capacitive soil moisture sensor is used by inserting it in the soil of the forest around plants and trees to make a low-cost real-time soil moisture monitoring possible, therefore helping us to adapt our values and bring corresponding results. As we can see, the applications for this sensor are soil moisture detection, intelligent agriculture, and automatic watering of the plants. As a bonus, we could advise to use silicon glue in order to protect the circuits above the warning line as they are not waterproof. The next sensor would be the GY906 infrared temperature sensor that is a very simple but highly precise breakout board designed to measure special temperatures contact us via infrared light. It can be used with Arduino or any other microcontroller that can communicate with it through its I2C interface which is a serial communication protocol so data is transferred bit by bit along a single wire, more exactly the SDA line. This sensor provides two values, one for air temperature and another one for object temperature, respectively the ground for our experiment. One important thing to be taken into account about this sensor is the distance range it has from the ground, preferable size being 10 cm, so we can get reasonable values about it. 
I said the applications for this sensor could be monitoring the temperature of something moving, like a spinning motor shaft or objects on a moving conveyor, also temperature control in printers and copiers, or livestock monitoring. The code explanation starts with include function, responsible for implementation of all the functions needed for the code to run. For example, Wi-Fi.h option is needed to provide Wi-Fi for the ESP32. PubSub client allows to send and receive MQTT messages, and EEPROM is an internal memory of ESP32 that allows to keep the memory when the port is turned off and on. Another option is Define, that helps explaining each pin what it stays for, but also the number of bytes needed to access in the flash memory, or the time in seconds ESP32 is in sleep mode, and how many times it has opened open up from deep sleep. Integers are the primary data type for number storage, so we can define wet or dry status. When calibrating the sensor, if any values need to be changed, it is enough to change the integer values, instead of changing them all over the code everywhere. Wi-Fi option states for the configuration of Wi-Fi credentials to be able to connect to the internet network. MQTT broker option is responsible for the configuration of the MQTT server and where all the topics are defined. In lines 25 and 26, we declare an object to allow establishing a connection. Line 27, the callback function is to tell a piece of code what function we need under some condition. Line 28, the ESP32 has a built-in timer. We use this code to wake the ESP32 after deep sleep. Line 29, the void setup is a function created at the top of each program that initializes and sets the initial values. In lines 30 to 44, you can find the explanation in detail in our documentation. They focus on establishing the Wi-Fi connection and the MQTT and printing the status of the connection. Line 45, the void loop function loops consecutively after creating a setup function, allowing the program to change and respond by controlling ESP32. Line 46 is to determine the biggest size of the character. Since the biggest number we have is 100, we use character 3. Line 48, we use the map to convert the value given by the capacitive soil moisture sensor when it is dry to 0 to indicate a 0% of soil moisture and converting the wet value to 100 to indicate a 100% of soil moisture. Line 49, we use the if statement to print only the values within the range specified since the capacitive soil moisture sensor sometimes gives results out of the range specified. Line 51, DTOSTRF is the D to string F function that includes four different parameters. The parameters are float value, minimum width, number digits after decimal, and where to store string. You can find them as well in detail in our documentation. Line 52, we publish the character array to the MQTT topic assigned so we can read them on Node-RED. And line 53, we use this function to put the SP32 into deep sleep. The target of this project is to collect data from the sensors and visualize them in graphs using Grafana software. The working principle is based on a series of steps for each sensor connected to ensure that the data is received by ESP32, processed by Node-RED, stored in InfluxDB and then charted using Grafana. So, the sensors are reporting the data to the ESP32 using the MQTT protocol, which then is publishing data to the EMQX, which is the MQTT broker. When Node-RED is subscribed, it is receiving JSON messages over the MQTT. Then, Node-RED converts the JSON messages to object and sends them via HTTP to InfluxDB, appearing to be the back-end database. Grafana, the front-end visualizer, will access all the stored information in InfluxDB and visualize them. We will explain them to you step-by-step step later. After creating the topic messages in the coding and send them via MQTT, we use the MQTT in node in Node-RED, we fill in the server information, the MQTT broker server used, the port here it is 1883 and it is the HTTP not secure, and the client ID. We save and we change the topic name based on the topics assigned in our coding and we save. Here we have 5 topics, so we fill the same server information for all of them, and we change only the topic names. Then we use the JSON option to convert between JSON, string, and object. Last node we use is the InfluxDB out. We fill in the server name. In the measurement, we type the same topic names used in the MQTT in nodes. This is how we connect all the nodes in a very simple way. The message.payload is just used to show the messages in Node-RED when clicking on debug messages. Now our information are stored in the InfluxDB. 
InfluxDB is just used as a connection between Node-RED and Grafana. Then we go on to Grafana. We click on the Add Data Source. Then search for InfluxDB. Select it and fill in our URL information and InfluxDB details. So we can link Grafana to InfluxDB. Then after creating our new dashboard and adding a new panel, in the Select Measurement tab, we can find all topics assigned from our sensors all the way to Grafana through MQTT Broker, Node-RED, and InfluxDB. Finally, we can fix the graphs based on the requirements to show the data. As shown before, where the sensors have been connected to ESP32 individually, the schematic is a representation of all the sensors all together. The ground pin on the sensors is connected to the ground pin on ESP32. VCC pin on the sensors is receiving voltage from the ESP32 through pin 3V3. To power our station, we are using the eLEGO 9 volt battery. In order to have continuous measurements without interruptions, we must calculate the battery life with a discharge of 10%. So the battery in the hours units is equal to the capacity of the battery in ampere hour divided by the output current taken from the battery in ampere hour. Our battery capacity is almost 550 milliamp hour equals to 0.55 amp hour. The output current taken from the battery when it is working is the sum of the output current of all sensors in the working state. So in total it's 0.0073 ampere. Speaking about the standby current, we have to take into consideration the ESP32 in this case. So the total sum of output current taken from the battery is 70.5 microampere equals to 7.05 times 10 to the power of minus 5 ampere. For a range of 15 minutes or 900 seconds, the battery working time is in intervals of 18 seconds followed by deep sleep mode for 882 seconds. Doing the calculations, the battery lifetime would be equals to 2557 hours when considering discharging it when reaching 10% so we can have continuous measurement without interruptions, the total would be approximately 2300 hours, meaning the battery would last 96 days according to the appropriate discharge rate. Powering ESP32 directly with a 9 volt battery is not recommended. Therefore, we need to use a voltage regulator to supply the ESP32 with 5 volts only. Using the Pololu voltage regulator and a voltmeter, we regulated the voltage to 5.39 volts. When connecting all the system together, we had a problem. The sensors were not collecting any data. To identify the problem, we connected the battery through a Pololu voltage regulator using the same 5.39 volts and we measured how much the output voltage from the ESP32 TV3 pin was. And in the two options shown in the pictures, the voltage results were 1.52 and 1.6. So 1.6 is not sufficient to power the sensors. For example, the capacitive soul moisture sensor requires 3.3 volts at least to work. Trying another way to provide a stable voltage to the ESP32, the power supply module 1PC in the eLEGO kit was our next choice. In all these pictures, we tried to work on many schematics using the 3.3 volts in the power supply or the 5 volt. In all options, the maximum voltage supplied from the ESP32 to the sensors was 2.2 volts, which is also insufficient to power our sensors. Our next step was to connect the battery directly to the ESP32 using a 5 volt pin as an input or the micro cable USB, so we could measure the voltage supplied from the ESP32. In the three schematics, the maximum voltage supplied was 2.73 volts, which is also insufficient to power our sensors. Using the 9V battery from the eLEGO kit is insufficient to power our station using the Pololo and the power supply module 1PC. For that reason, we should find another way to power our station. As we had no other components to link the battery to the ESP32, we used a Samsung 5V adapter to power our station directly from the electricity. For the installation part, the system consists of three sensors, ESP32, breadboard and wires. All the components used are not waterproof and they should be protected except the capacitive soil moisture sensor from the lower part of the sensor. We used a waterproof plastic box to place all the components inside and to connect the DHT11 and the GY906 we made an 8 inches hole in the bottom of the plastic box using an electric screwdriver to pass the wires to the outside and make them hang from the box. A small plastic food container is attached from the bottom so the sensors can be protected from the rain. The capacitive soil moisture sensor cable is passed through a special waterproof opening from the side of the box directly to the ground. The final prototype of the machine is ready to be placed in the field and start collecting data. For more details on the installation, you can refer to our documentation.
In conclusion, we can definitely say that some limitations for our station have been figured out, starting with the quality of the components because the battery power was an obstacle to provide enough voltage to operate the system on a long time range and because of the poor availability of a nearby Wi-Fi connection to be able to use it in the forest. Overall, the station is applicable for small-scale objectives, but still there is a place for improvement for larger projects. <laughs>